Let me, let me start a different way. Um, the the practice through which individuals, not communities, but individuals, select against uh, Down syndrome is the practice of prenatal diagnosis. So let's be very concrete and ask, first of all, what is it and who's doing the selecting and why? Right. Um, prenatal diagnosis is a way of finding out uh, when a fetus is a fetus, whether that um, fetus has or does not have certain genetic characteristics. And in a case of Down syndrome, the vast majority of persons with Down syndrome carry an extra chromosome. Um, they have um, a three copies of chromosome 23. Uh, so you can find that out by um, prenatal diagnosis. And at that point, you can say to the pregnant woman and the partner, um, there's a pretty good chance, in fact, um, I'd be willing to say it's a 100% chance that when this baby is born, this baby's going to have Down syndrome. Can't tell you how severely affected by the Downs the individual will be. Uh, there's a range of um, you know, IQ scores, for example, as one measure of uh, the condition. There's a range of IQ scores for people with Downs. There's a range of uh, cardiac disabilities that people with Downs have. So um, the person doing the test can only say there's an extra 23 chromosome, can't say what the range is. And then it's up to the parents in uh, the United States and most of the rest of the world. It's up to the parents to decide whether or not they want that pregnancy to continue. Okay, so the agents of selection in this particular case that people are so worried about um, are parents. Parents who are facilitated by or enabled by a medical practice to find out whether or not the fetus that's growing in uh, the woman's womb uh, does or does not carry that 23 chromosome. So there we've got a situation in which the people who are doing, making the decision are the people who are going to raise that individual. It's not the individual making the decision about whether or not his or her quality of life is a good one. It's the people who are going to have to nurture that individual who are making the decision. And from their perspective, and I can tell you because this data has been collected, at least in the United States, um, that overall it differs by community, it differs by ethnicity, it differs by religion, but overall 95% of the uh, mothers who are told that um, the fetus they're carrying has a 23rd chromosome, uh, three copies of the 23rd chromosome, decide not to continue the pregnancy. So, so the, the question, question of selection is a question in the bad process. And that's absolutely true. And of course, this has to do with reproductive freedom, which brings us back right, to right. the question of feminism. But the question that I would want to ask, which is the question that the disability rights uh, movement asks too, is that the context in which one makes choices about what kind of child uh, is to be brought into the world is not a neutral context. Um, no, we no. live in a society which um, profoundly values some human characteristics and profoundly devalues some human characteristics. And it also uh, believes assiduously in the idea that we can, and I'm going to use the term again that I offered up, and that is to shape not just human beings, but the communities in which human beings live. And the question that I think is important to ask is the one that I brought before, and that is what do we lose when we eliminate some forms of human variation? In other words, what kinds of contributions, what kinds of variations do we want to have and not have? Now, historically, of course, 
we know that uh, the modern era uh, is characterized particularly by um, a kind of impulse to standardize human beings. Uh, Weber called it rationalization. So that we are encouraged in the larger cultural context to work toward a certain sameness, a certain standardization of, of people. And if we lose, for example, uh, the kind of people that uh, we consider the people to have Down syndrome, uh, do we lose something by losing that human variation? Um, and do we lose the actual variety of human beings? And how important is that? Um, if we turn to, exam for example, to, uh, let's say, hereditary blindness or hereditary deafness as another example, which I think is actually, uh, are fairly interesting examples, um, the question would be what can deafness offer us and what can blindness offer us, even though those traits are generally considered to be um, not just disabilities, but great disadvantages. There's another way of looking at that. For example, uh, people who are born deaf tend to, not tend to, but develop an indigenous sign language that is very useful to human beings because, of course, toward the end of life, anyone who lives long enough actually becomes deaf as well. And if we had the variation of modes of communication that deaf people can offer, um, it would be very beneficial for older people when they're entering into society to have much more of an acceptance, say, of deafness and much more of a valuing of alternative means of communication besides speaking and hearing to make the world actually work better. And so deaf people, particularly people who are deaf from birth, can contribute tremendously to that. Uh, I, think I think there's, there's no, no question, question that, that at, least, at least if I were running the world, I would like to see enormous variation in human populations. But, but to, to me, me as an historian, I have to say that I truly believe, and I'd be prepared to argue at great length, that we have more variation today than there's ever been before. I don't agree um, with Weber and the other sociologists who see modernity as an effort to um, you know, stamp out increasingly mass-produced, produced, identical, identical human beings. Human beings. Culture, Culture has, has always, always tried, tried to make to human beings' populations conform to, to some, some kind of ideal. ideal. 